remember is, unlike these guys who are moving and are constantly changing, this thing would seem like very static and very kind of motionless. But all we have to do is dig a hole in the middle of this, in this country deep enough and what we're going to find out once we dig the hole is we get to, we eventually run out of a, a, a solid earth and we get to the, to the, what composes most of the planet which is mobile lavas and magmas doing this kind of stuff. The center of the earth is molten iron uh, which is at the hottest possible temperature and is much hotter than the surface of the earth. So that's a temperature difference, that's an intensive difference. And the lavas are being organized just like these things are being organized. Lavas underneath us are organized like conveyor belts, like circulatory patterns of self-organized molten rock. And it is on top of those conveyor belts that, that, the, that the continents are traveling. So, for instance, let me give you an example. When we look at the Himalayas, or when we look at the Alps, we see something pretty much finished. It's been there for thousands of years, and it will be here for another thousands of years, unless someone's nu or someone nukes them. But without that eventuality, they will be here. Yet the Himalayas, or at least certain parts of the Tibetan Plateau, are still moving up one millimeter a year. One millimeter a year is, is too, too slow a becoming for anyone to bother. Say, when Mao and his troops invaded Tibet, his captain didn't tell him, oh, about uh, generalissimo, uh, we, can, we have to invade Tibet today because next year it will be one millimeter higher. You know, Mao would have said, one millimeter, you know, that doesn't make, mean anything. Nevertheless, it does mean something because it means that India is still clashing against Central Asia driven by lava flows and they are still folding the Himalayas which is all they are, they are folded rock and they are still going up a certain, a certain amount, a, a, a tiny little portion a year because those, because those lavas are still, they are a body with that organs made out of lava and magma that is dry, that is still creating those organs that are floating on top of it. We humans tend to look at this part and think that this is home, because this is home. We build our houses here, we buy pieces of land, and we, uh, we admire the visibility because from, you know, from here to over here, that's my land, and I'm going to build my house in here. We don't understand that underneath that land there's a body with our organs, and on top of it there's a naughty body with our organs, and that everything that's mobile and creative in this planet is not fixed and, and, and territorialized and divisible into territories but something that's fluid and undivisible something fluid and constantly animated so intensive differences are important in many different cases I'm going to give you other examples of how intensity is that drive processes and this is a particularly Delusian contribution because if you don't find this in a textbook of thermodynamics, it was Deleuze who said, well yes, of course, meteorologists know this, but the people have not made this into a philosophical principle. And he did. And you can tell why. The word difference. Since he is the, the philosopher of difference, not only does he need differences in, this, in the sense of mutations and sexual recombinations, differences in genes, he also needs differences in energy, differences that are productive because they drive processes. If you want to have a specific image in your head of an intensive difference, think of a battery, you know, a Duracell battery or any other kind of battery. A battery is just a bunch of chemical substances sandwiched together into other chemical substances that, are, that have intensive differences, in this case it's not differences in speed or temperature or pressure, there are differences in pH, like acidity and alkalinity, or differences in oxidation and reduction, and always chemical intensive differences. But nevertheless, as long as the differences are alive, you can plug your battery into your Walkman and drive a flow of electricity and listen to your music. 
Once the differences die, your battery is dead, you cannot drive any fiber processes. So a battery is an industrial commodi commodified form of an intensive difference. But just like we are used to the fact that everything needs batteries to be drawn, or when you, when you plug things into the wall, you're going into electrical, differences in electrical potential, intensive differences in voltage, and it's those intensive differences in voltage that drive your machines, and when there's a blackout, we all feel naked because all of a sudden we, are not, we cannot plug into intensive differences. So start thinking about it, intensive thinking as that form of thinking that explains to us what's driving all those processes, the processes that will replace essences. We always need to think about what's driving the processes, what fuels the processes. So this is Deleuze's first contribution to intensive thinking. It goes from a mere definition in terms of properties to something that is now philosophical. The second, the second contribution is to say intensive properties, unlike extensive properties, are characterized by critical points of intensity at which things change dramatically from one set of properties to another set of properties. The most obvious example are the points of crystallization or the, 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 the or, and points of vaporization or gasification that occur to say water. We have water, liquid water, which is the one that we are most likely to, to encounter in our lives. But if you put that water into the freezer, you eventually get ice cubes, which means that at a particular point of intensity, zero degrees centigrade to be exact, water moves spontaneously from fluid to crystallized. It becomes an ice cube. So let me just write this down here. We have gas, liquid, solid. In the case of water, this is vapor, this is liquid water, and this is ice. It's the same stuff. It's water, it's H2O, but it presents itself in different ways. It can be vapor, it can be liquid, it can be solid. And these transition points, this one here and this one here, always occur at the same critical point of intensity. So intensive difference is the second way in which they are unlike extensive properties, is that they have those critical points of intensity at which things spontaneously transform themselves. There are many other examples of these sequences. For instance, air or water below a certain uh, below a certain point, and let me just write it down here, uh, uniform weighting any flow, whether air or water, when it goes at a very low speed, speed being of course another intensive property, flows relatively uniformly, relatively calmly, relatively homogeneously. At a critical point of speed, it becomes periodic. It organizes itself into circular motions. Those circular motions we can see them in the atmosphere as famous wind currents. For instance, the currents that brought Columbus to America. You remember that in the age before uh, steam power in ships, you needed sails. You needed to deploy your sails because with your sails you were going to tap into winds and they were going to push you into your destination. Columbus tapped into the power of what is called the trade winds. The trade winds are an enormous conveyor belt of circulatory air. It's just air that organizes itself spontaneously into a circle and has been there for hundreds of years. It's still there 